Hi, this is Dr. Mikola Rashik again of Mara Genomics making another video up update on mRNA vaccines. And today's topic is what else? Omicron, of course. And I wanted to discuss as to why this new variant is gaining so much attention and why there is so much potential fear mongering behind this variant. However, some of this, I believe, is actually justified in terms of, yes, we should be paying careful attention to this new emerging variant. So to give you some of the context, first I wanted to show you a slide I made where I compiled the mutations seen in previous variants and how they relate to what is now seen in Omicron. And, and at the very top right here, we see all of the different mutations found in the Omicron variant just in a spike gene alone. So you can see there's a wide constellation of mutations in the spike gene alone there's more mutations in the rest of the virus genome. And the point here is to show you that multiple of these mutations have previously been seen in other variants already. And we know that these mutations might have contributed to both the previous variants being able to escape some of the neutralizing antibodies or to increase their power of infection. So the, that's one of the worries is that Omicron now has collected many of these previously seen mutations in a single variant as well as has a many brand new mutations as well. One thing that I did not list here is this mutation part there. That's where three bases of the viral genomes are missing. This has been previously observed in other variants as well, except not three, but only two of these. So I didn't list them, but that's another mutation that has been previously observed. Now what I wanted to show you is a paper that was recently published. And this paper might also give us some clues as to why we should be nervous about Omicron to some degree and at least definitely pay careful attention. This was a paper published by Dr. Bienash from the Rockefeller University in New York. I just recently watched his webinar presented uh, to the National Institute of Health. Really fantastic work uh, that, that uh, his laboratory is doing. And this paper that, that was just published recently, I want to show you some of the results. And we're going to focus on this. So right here, bear with me, I'll explain everything to you. So right here, what we're seeing is um, on top, let's focus right here. What they did is they culture cells and what human cells and what they did is they exposed those cells to both the virus, except this was a fake virus construct. So that it, it was partially SARS-CoV-2 and partially another virus. So this, so this would not be a dangerous infectious agent. So basically this allowed them to to control it and make sure that it's safe. And they cultured those cells in the presence of both the virus as well, and this is the key, as well as the antibodies isolated from the blood of survivors of previous infection, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Though that blood was isolated after at least 30 days post-infection and as a consequence, there were antibodies specifically already built uh, in those individuals to be able to fight the virus. And they cultured these cells and they passaged them, meaning they, they cultured them, then they took some, they cultured them again. And uh, this allows the virus to mutate uh, in the presence of, of uh, these antibodies that are attacking the virus and by culturing them again, you can see which mutations have been selected as a consequence um, in order to help the virus survive. And in the top panel, you see which mutations, where, which areas were selected, where, where mutations were most frequently selected in their experiment. And what's interesting, this is where they, in the middle panel, that's what these mutations are. They mapped all of these mutations. Here you have this, this uh, this is now full, full length um, protein here. 
as, and here's the neutral, uh, the enzyme on the domain of spike protein. And here in red, we see the receptor binding domain. If you want to know what these are more specifically, please watch my last video on number 20. I explained that in more detail. And you can see where, where the mutations were observed most frequently in N terminal domain and receptor domain, which are really important in interaction of the virus with the receptors on human cells. Uh, the, the, those are the domains that are important. So not surprisingly, that's where these mutations uh, are, are especially found most frequently. But what's interesting is here at the very bottom panel, you can see where the mutations in the virus are most frequently found in the variants that have been previously observed uh, amongst the global uh, population. And you can see that very often the same areas that the authors were able to show how antibodies are selecting specific areas to be uh, to be selected that are mutated, these type of areas are also selected in natural world. So what they're observing in a lab in a Petri dish is also observed in the real world where it appears that antibodies might be selecting specific mutations to thrive in, in, in the viral population. So this is probably the very first evidence we have indicating how antibodies could be driving selection of specific variants in order to emerge subsequently. And the worry of this is that this type of behavior could actually drive what is referred to as immune escape. I did uh, discuss immune escape previously in one of my videos. I believe this was video number 10, so you can check this out. In essence, it basically we're talking about is where the virus could be mutating its way out of being able to be properly targeted by antibodies, including vaccinal antibodies, meaning that eventually the virus could be no longer affected by the antibodies we're throwing at it. And, and the reason why this is significant is because many of the Omicron mutations are also found in what these uh, authors were observing. And just to show you how powerful this is. Actually, let's go back here and I'll show you this. This is, this is basically where the mutations are, are being found most frequently where they're being selected. So once again, here's a three-dimensional image of the spike protein. As, as you can see, receptor binding domain, this is the area that is involved in interacting with the receptors found on a hum on our human cells. Those are ACE2 receptors and terminal domain on a periphery found uh, observed in green. That's the top view right here. This is a side view. This is what I referred in my previous uh, video as the head of the spike protein versus this is where the trunk of the spike protein is. And here, this is what the, these authors were observing, how in their in their culture cells, how the antibodies from the plasma of survivors were select where they were where these antibodies were selecting most frequent mutations, and you can see most frequent mutations have been selected in the receptor binding domain, as well as in terminal domains. And now, if you compare in the real world, in the real world, same thing is happening. So what we see in a petri dish, we're seeing also in the real world. And what these authors did is they combined all of these mutants and they generated their own new super powerful virus, if you will. And this is what we're seeing right here. This is, this is the virus, the constellation of these 20 most potent mutations that you can find. And when they infected, cells again with this new virus that they developed, PMS20, with the worst 20 mutations possible. And they treated that, those human cells in the presence of this virus. Here you can see the difference. 
this shows you how different plasma donors were being, how they responded or how well they could neutralize the, the natural virus. This is SARS-CoV-2 in gray. And there's different potency levels of being able to deal with, with the virus. But then if you compare it in red against this new super mutant that the authors generated, you could see that seldom the plasma of, of the survivors could actually neutralize this very potent, dangerous virus. What this means is that if you have the specific right mutations in the virus, virus could really basically escape the ability of our, of our antibodies to neutralize it and or and effectively prevent it from being able to infect our cells. And the worry here is that the same pattern was observed also with antibodies um, from vaccinated individuals. And you can see vaccinated individuals' antibodies can neutralize the virus quite effectively. That's the SARS-CoV-2. This is the original strain, as opposed to this new construct that is that the authors developed with the top 20 worst mutations and once again you can see for the most part seldom could vaccinal antibodies deal with this this new um, strain and the reason why this this why i'm even showing you st this research is because many of these mutations that omicron has are already are the same ones that are that are in this top 20 worst mutations found. So we're talking about this mutation right here is found in Omicron. This is found in Omicron. Let's see, this one and, and 445 is there, 484 is there, 501, and this one as well. So you can see number of these mutations already present together in, in Omicron. Now, so does that convert to the real world? Well, perhaps, and, and there's a brand new paper that just came out a few days ago. This is only a preprint, meaning it has not yet been peer reviewed, which means you always have to look at these with certain dose of skepticism. But nevertheless, that's that's the beauty of preprints is that they're instantly available. And this is the image I wanted to focus on right here. And what this image shows, it, it basically graphs the progression of the pandemic in South Africa. So in a very top panel, what you see is the three different distinct waves in South Africa. And the first wave of 2020, it started just at the end of December um, 2020 and start of 2021. That was the, driven by beta. This third wave was driven predominantly by the delta. And you can see right there, just this tiny little uptick that's the that's now what the worry is is that this is the omicron uh, wave starting right here in the middle panel it shows you how many people with each wave there was an increase of how many people have already been previously infected so it basically it shows you that the more waves we have the more people end up being infected and uh, and surviving the infection so that makes sense that obviously as the pro pandemic progresses, more and more people end up being infected. What's interesting is the bottom panel because the bottom panel actually maps the frequency of reinfection of those individuals who have previously be, been infected by SARS-CoV-2 virus. So whether, whether we're talking about not, um, people who are vaccinated or unvaccinated, and it shows you that there was a certain level of reinfection in the beta well the wave and obviously certain level of reinfection in it in a delta wave as well but in essence if you look at this one you can see these waves are big but in essence omicron this is reinfection during omicron wave right here and what you can see is that even though the wave hasn't even started yet the reinfection rate is massive and what these authors calculated that while prior infection actually protected you from reinfection in beta and delta wave, even though reinfections did occur, they were occurring, it's just because of the sheer number of people who were being infected. Nevertheless, your prior infection, what the authors showed in the beta and delta wave, protected you from being reinfected, reduced your 
your risk of being reinfected versus with Omicron, that's no longer the case. It's the other way around. With Omicron, what these authors are calculating that there's a massive increase in reinfection risk. What this means together is that, that Omicron appears to have the ability to dramatically bypass the antibodies that are, that are um, in the blood of people who have been previously infected, meaning Omicron has the, according to this paper, has the ability to bypass not neutralizing antibodies of, from natural infection. Now, the question is, does this correlate to people who are vaccinated? And recall, I mentioned this uh, previously as well, that um, neutralizing antibodies in vaccinated people are quite similar as those in natural infection. So yes, there is a possibility that we should be able to see something similar in vaccinated individuals. We don't have necessarily data for it, but I'll show you one more, uh, one more report. This is from UK. I like checking UK reports because they do such an excellent job. And let's uh, go to, we're going to look at this page first. And what this page maps is current history of uh, Omicron spread around the world. Uh, so not many cases yet, but it shows you predominantly the dark green is, is South Africa and you can see how the Omicron is spreading around the world. So you can map which countries are, are, um, are involved thus far. And now let's look at uh, UK uh, very quickly. Uh, UK now has um, 22 cases according to this report and, and most of them came through London. That's not a surprise because that's an entry port. This is what these cases look like um, based on gender and age. So you can see that males um, seem to be the predominant carriers so far at, and with these 22 cases, but that's not the point yet. That's not, not much data. You can see that all age groups are susceptible to being uh, able to be infected by Omicron. And here is an interesting data in terms of who was vaccinated. And here you can see that of the 22 cases, six were unvaccinated, 12 were fully vaccinated, two were vaccinated with one dose, so 14 vaccinated individuals. And so the point is, is that it shows you that yes, vaccinated people can also be, be in, infected. Now this might, might not be representing reality yet. And the reason why is because uh, to some degree, unvaccinated people are restricted from um, being able to fly. So it might make sense that in context of flying, vaccinated people are more likely to be infected and, and spread the, the Omicron than unvaccinated people just because they don't have as easy access to be able to fly anymore. But here's another report that uh, a friend of mine showed me and this report uh, presented by Reuters mentioned that uh, there were two Israeli doctors that were vaccinated with three doses of the Pfizer BioNTech that were nevertheless uh, infected with Omicron. So even three doses was not enough to be able to, to stop infection with Omicron. So, that, so basically it points to the picture that potentially Omicron might be one of those very first variants that might escape the immunity from both natural infection or vaccinal antibodies. Does the escape immunity was the worry since the start of the pandemic. And this is now we're also seeing some evidence that potentially it's the antibodies that might be driving that uh, immune escape by helping to select which mutants should be thriving in a population. At least uh, the evidence from New York that I presented to you, well, that's potentially problematic if this turns out to be true. Remember, no science paper is um, should ever be taken as a gospel until it's been repeated multiple times. Um, nevertheless, if if um, 
our antibodies are potentially driving immune escape of the virus, that's problematic because we might trap ourselves in a situation where we constantly have to chase treatment of, of infection by throwing more and more antibodies, but at the same time run the potential risk of creating more and more dangerous variants. So I'll show you one more paper that just came out again as a preprint. And so this is where the, the this is where the preprint lies. And the reason why I, why I wanted to show you this particular paper is to show you how incredible viruses can be. And what's unusual about Omicron uh, is that it has a unique insertion that has never been seen before. So insertions is where is where a new genetic code material enters the viral genome code and that hasn't been there before. So insertions are more rare because that new genetic material has to come from somewhere else. Um, typically virus will either mutate where there is a change from, from one nucleotide for another or there might be deletions just like Omicron also has deletions. And, and this particular uh, Omicron, the, this particular variant has its own unique insertion where two additional, uh, three, addi sorry, three additional amino acids are being inserted in place of, of what was there. And the reason why this, what was interesting about this particular preprint is because we're gonna go to the very bottom where the figures are is because what they mentioned is that what they suspected that this insertion might have come from one of the cold, common cold viruses. And they're showing here, so here's what uh, uh, a segment of a sequence of a SARS-CoV-2 virus, and they're showing how the sequence that is now found in Omicron, which is what we see right here, might have come from one of the common colds. And, here it show you, shows you that if an individual is infected by both viruses at the same time, the common cold as well as our SARS-CoV-2, the, the, the two genomes could have recombined and that's how we might have had this extra insertion in the Omicron. They also, the authors also speculate that the same insertion could have actually come from our own RNAs. So recall in, I believe, um, Video number 19, I talked about how you go from DNA to RNA and we produce tons and tons of RNA. Well, some of our own RNA virus can hijack tiny elements of that information and insert, have it inserted in its own genome. So it just, the point of the, the message here is that the mutational capacity of the virus is enormous. So, so um, we don't know yet what the outcome of this particular mutation will be. It's the first time we're seeing, but it might be very difficult to be able to, to control the virus uh, with just antibodies. And uh, I'll show you one more really neat figure that the authors did as well. And in this big figure, what you see is how, the, how Omicron right here shares different mutations with the other most predominant and, and most dangerous variants, which were alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And you can see only one mutation is shared amongst all of them. And this, this basically shows you how different mutations of each of the previous variants are being shared in Omicron. But, and what we have mapped here around are the unique mutations for each of the of the variant and where and where they are located on a spike protein. So remember, this is the head of the spike protein. Here is the trunk, and what it shows you that Omicron has 26 unique mutations and where they map that have never been seen before. So we have we have a lot to yet to yet. Uh, and sorry, I shouldn't say never seen before. Never seen in the most dominant variants. So we still have yet to uncover a lot of the significance of this. And this is together why Omicron is, um, is uh, basically gaining so much attention and potential worry as to the future outcomes. Now, there is also discussion that this is, the good news is that it's creating a mild disease. However, that's actually too soon to know, to be honest. And the reason why is because Omicron is not a dominant variant at all. And the severity of the disease that a variant might 
have on a population can actually be dependent to a degree on the frequency of the virus in, in being available in the population. So we, if the frequency of the virus increases and Omicron starts taking over the world and starts creating its own big wave, the severity of the disease could actually change at that point because the dynamics between the virus and the population changes. So it's still yet many things yet unknown, but for sure Omicron should be taken seriously and should be tracked carefully. And um, it seems like it might be one of the very first serious, serious variants that had the possibility uh, to demonstrate immune escape. So that's all I wanted to mention in this particular video. If you like this video, give us a like, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, definitely share. So that's all, all the stuff that YouTube likes and we like. What I also wanted to mention is two things, is that I wanted to have the audience participate in the direction of the future video. So I have, um, I have set up, a, I have set up a, a survey that you can participate in and determine as to what the future video uh, should be. So check this out, the link to the survey, it will be in a description. So there are different topics you can select from. And um, this way, there's just so much data coming in is that I, uh, I cannot even make all the different videos that I wish I could make. So I just thought maybe it would be great if the audience decide, decides as to what they want to see next. And another thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, we, we had a great, great first um, COVID-19 Q&A session. Uh, it was sold out, a lot of people came. It took, took a while to answer all the questions. We're having another one in the middle of December. So check that out. Um, we will be giving uh, some tickets uh, away for free. My marketing director gave me 10 tickets to give away for free. So those who subscribe to the newsletter, the first 10 people will get those tickets. And so um, the link is also in the description for subscription. Uh, and otherwise, check out the event and hopefully we'll have, a, uh, again, an amazing turnout like last time. That's it for today. And everyone have a great day. Bye for now.